All right. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is botulinum toxin. And I think many of you have experience with botulinum toxin just because it's one of our first lines with regards to treatment for blepharospasm. And I apologize if it's uh, simple or repetitive or uh, redundant with regards to what you know. But what I'd like to talk about is a little bit of the, I think one of the, the biggest things, especially for some of you that may not have uh, had injections yet, is first of all, is that it's, it's sort of frightening to think that you're having this, this lethal toxin injected into your body. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that and try to uh, convince you that it's not that bad and it's not that, uh, and that it actually is very safe but um, also talk about some of the new things that have happened recently with regards to botulinum toxin. Now, I have no financial disclosures associated with this topic. You know, botulinum toxin, it's a neurotoxic uh, protein, and it, it causes, causes a flaccid paralysis. So what that means is that it causes um, paralysis. Basically, it makes your muscles unable to move. And we know this most commonly just because it's associated or it's, it's what causes uh, botulism. And, you know, botulism, or botulinum toxin, is actually the most lethal toxin known. And so again, we're gonna talk about, even though we know this, what we're doing and what we're using it for medically is actually very safe. Uh, but medium lethal dose is actually very, very small, so it's an incredibly lethal toxin, but also this is what makes it so useful for us uh, in medicine. And again, you know, how do you get botulism? Well, improperly canned foods or poorly preserved foods. So, you know, fortunately, there's not a lot of canning that's done anymore, sort of uh, at home. But, you know, years ago, a lot of people did at home canning. And, uh, you know, there were possible problems associated with this. There are eight types of botulinum toxins. Type A and B are the ones that we use medically, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, then there's type C to G, which are less common. We're really not gonna talk uh, much about those at all. You know, the history of the use of botulinum toxin in medicine is really interesting because it really was started by Alan Scott in San Francisco. So Dr. Scott is a pediatric ophthalmologist and basically what he wanted to do was use the toxin to help align eyes. So he's a strabismus doctor. So most pediatric ophthalmologists, uh, the vast majority of them do strabismus surgery. And what that means is that kids are often born with eyes that are not aligned. And so by using the toxin to potentially weaken muscles that were pulling the eye in or pulling the eye out, the idea was that you could then straighten the eyes with this toxin. And this was first performed in 1977. And the name of you know, botulinum toxin, initially the uh, brand name was oculinum, which basically just means eye aligner. And by 1985, actually, the protocol for injection for uh, sites and dosage for the treatment of blepharospasm and strabismus were worked out. So mid 80s, you know, we hear a lot about botulinum toxin now with regards to its cosmetic uses, but really for the first 15, almost 20 years of its existence, it was used for strabismus and it was used for blepharospasm and some of the other dystonias. So even though now it's a huge business with regards to its use cosmetically, initially, really, it was used for this problem. And Dr. Scott really was the one who, who started all of this. Interestingly, though, in 1986, uh, they couldn't get product liability uh, insurance for this product. And for months, a lot of patients here in the U.S. had to go to Canada to get their injections uh, prior to, to oculinum being able to get their license. However, in 1989, it was actually acquired by Allergan, and that's when they changed the name from oculinum to Botox. And that was the first, uh, our, you know, the first commercially available uh, botulinum toxin was oculinum, which then changed its name to Botox. So how does this toxin work? Well, when we think about how our muscles work, we have a nerve that is basically innervate, or basically connected to a muscle. So the muscle is innervated by the nerve, and when we tell that muscle to move, the nerve has to send a transmission to the muscle. Now there's a little space between the, the nerve and the muscle, 
And in order for that muscle to work, that nerve has to release this thing called acetylcholine, this chemical called acetylcholine. So basically, what botulinum toxin does is just inhibit the release of that chemical so that the muscle cannot work. And so when this is injected, usually the, on-site, uh, the onset of action is as early as two to three days, and then peak effect is usually at about a week or so. So when you, you know, if and when you would get injections for blepharospasm, uh, you're not gonna notice an effect that night or even the next day. You know, it's really gonna be a few days before you notice that there is a change. Now, the problem, though, is that this wears off at about, after about three to four months. And that's good and that's bad. It's good in the sense that, well, if you didn't like the effect or if the effect was too much, um, then it's going to wear off. So there's very little risk with regards to uh, the use of this. However, it's also bad because if you like the effect, then you have to go back every three to four months to get the injections. So again, I don't want to get too caught up on the mechanism of action here, but really all that this is doing is inhibiting the release of acetylcholine, which is the chemical that transmits that signal between the nerve and the muscle. Um, you know, the current available toxins used in medicine are basically, like I said, type A and type B. There's about four that are available for type A. You know, the most common ones are Botox, Dysport, Xeomin, uh, and then for type B, it's uh, Myoblock. And uh, some of these are available here in the U.S., some of them are not. Um, with regards to the safety profile, as I said, I, you know, most lethal toxin, you know, that we know in medicine. But in the doses that we use, this is very safe. Um, with regards to adverse reactions that we see in blepharospasm patients, you can get a droopy lid. So the way that happens is that when we're injecting these, we're injecting these into the muscle that helps close the lid. And the eyelid is very thin, and very close by is also the muscle that opens the lid. So potentially, that toxin can diffuse to the area of the muscle that helps open the lid, and you can get a droopy lid. Um, if we are really effective, or too effective with regards to taking care of the closure of the eyes, then you don't close well, and you can potentially get dryness. And so you can get uh, findings on the cornea, as Dr. Weicker and Dr. Hamadi showed, um, with regards to superficial punctate keratitis. So these are just basically corneal findings of dry eyes, and then obviously you, your eyes can also feel dry. But really, no definitive serious adverse events have been reported um, of distant spread of the toxin effect associated with its use for blepharospasm. So you might hear or read about um, you know, some serious adverse effects in the use of Botox, but those are really used for other things other than blepharospasm. Those are when patients are using really, really high doses, and we'll talk about that. So, I'm going to show you a picture of a, a this is one of, uh, actually she was a nurse that worked with me back in Iowa, and she was getting cosmetic Botox, and I gave her an injection, and she got a droopy lid. And so I had to walk into work every day for the next, it was about four to six weeks, and see her droopy lid. And she said, still droopy. And I was like, fortunately, you're not going to be able to get me to court before that raises. But, um, you know, realistically, it, it, it will go away, but it's, it's really frustrating for the patient if you cause them to have a droopy lid or some of the other effects. But again, fortunately, it, it always goes away. Um, you know, with regards to dosages in blepharospasm in general, we say we shouldn't exceed 400 units in a three-month interval in adults. But realistically, in most of our blepharospasm patients, it's really rare to exceed 100 units in blepharospasm. I mean, I think more commonly, depending upon who your physician is and what their patterns of injection are, I think we probably use somewhere between 25 and 50 units often. And really, those big doses are used in things like lower limb spasticity. So patients who, you know, have uh, cerebral palsy, who, who have a, a contracted limb, you know, you want to relax those muscles, and you're going to use really big doses in those patients. But that's not what we're using in blepharospasm. You know, when we look at the definition of a unit for botulinum toxin, you know, we talk about mouse units, and one mouse unit is equivalent to the amount of toxin that kills 50% of 
of a group of 20 gram Swiss Webster mice within three days of intraperitoneal injection. So what that means is that one unit is going to kill 50% of this relatively small mouse. 20 grams, pretty small graph. So the LD50, so the lethal dose in 50% of botulinum toxin for a 70 kilogram male has been calculated to be about 2,500 to 3,000 units. That's a huge, huge dose. And so nobody is going to be injecting that. You know, most of us don't even have that much in our office at a time. I mean, that's really, you know, 25 to 30 vials in your, in your office. So it's a huge amount. And so, you know, really bottom line more than anything else is that the dosage used in blepharospasm is extremely, extremely safe. So where do we inject it when we inject patients with this? Well, we're usually going to inject it since it's a problem with the closure of the eyelids. What we want to do is actually weaken the muscle that closes the lid. And so Dr. Yan will talk about surgical way in which you can do this. But usually we're going to start with chemodenervation, which means injection of botulinum toxin. So standard injection sites are just you know a couple on the upper lid, maybe one or two on the lower lid. But realistically, Everybody, all physicians have a different pattern, I would say. And I think that that's really important to realize is that I think a lot of us, as we treat blepharospasm patients, we say, hmm, this amount in, this, uh, in these areas is a good place to start. And then maybe we'll alter that as we go along. But I think a lot of us inject differently. And that's not good or bad necessarily, but really what it comes down to is that if you switch physicians, you want to make sure that you have your pattern diagrammed so that your next physician will know what has worked for you. A lot of it in the first few treatments in the use of botulinum toxin is to figure out what works for you. So most of us start relatively low with regards to the dosage see how that goes, and then you're going to come back and you're going to say, mm, it was good, didn't do anything for me, or it was too much, and then we're going to modify the injection patterns according to what you tell us. So it's important to, you to sort of have a diary after the injections to tell us exactly where it's working and where it is not working. And again, you also want to make sure that you're using the same toxins in the sense that, okay, one, one physician may use a lot of Botox, one physician may use a lot of Xeomin. And so if you're going to switch between physicians, again, it's good to not just only have a diagram with the amount that is used, but also which toxin is used so that you can make sure that you're not sort of reinventing the wheel when you start up, if you would start up with a new physician. So again, different places to use it. But again, what we're trying to do more than anything else is weaken the orbicularis muscle, which is the muscle that, ooh, sorry, which is the muscle that uh, closes the lid. And also we have the protractors of the medial brow, which pull the brow down. Okay. And so a lot of times we'll weaken those areas. But again, you know, a lot of it for, for you guys is that we're trying to find the optimal dose for each patient. This is not a one size fits all injection pattern. Different injection patterns work well for different patients. And so again, a lot of it is what your feedback is with regards to what injection worked for you, what injection didn't, where it may have been too much or not enough. So like I said, usually most of us would start low and increase to a dose that's optimal. But like I said, every, every surgeon, every doctor injects a little differently. And um, you know, basically, I think it's really useful for you guys to have a diary afterwards, just because you think that you're going to remember it when you come in at three months. But a lot of times, you're like, mm, was that a good spot or not? So again, sort of keeping, uh, keeping track of these. So I'm going to show a video here of um, hoping to. Maybe I'm not. Here we go. Okay. So just going to show a video of a patient getting uh, botulinum toxin injection. So she has, she has blepharospasm. She also has some facial, uh, lower face movement as well. And, uh, um, you know, in this video, the surgeon, uh, this is actually done by Keith Carter up at the University of Iowa. And uh, basically, he's going to do preceptal injections. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But when we look at the orbicularis muscle, we have the muscle that's sort of right over the eyelid, which is called the pretarsal muscle. 
and then the preceptal is a little higher to that. And there's different opinions with regards to whether you want to go into the pretarsal or preceptal muscle. So this patient's getting four, two injections um, in the upper and lower lid, so medial injections and lateral injections. And different things you can do to make patients comfortable for this. Um, you know, I think everybody's different. Uh, you know, you have some patients that will, you know, not have a problem with the injections. Some patients who really, really have a hard time with the injections. Since there's going to be some, he's given an injection into the uh, corrugator muscle, which is one of the muscles above the brow that that decre that pulls the brow down. And again, he's going into the presar pretarsal orbicularis muscle, I'm sorry, the preceptal uh, orbicularis muscle, both medially and laterally. And in this patient, um, you know, he's given about five units, I think, per injection site just because of the diffusion that I know that he uses. He's given 0.1 and he, he gives five units per 0.1. And then also another one into the corrugator. So with regards to the injections in general, I think, um, you know, for some people tolerate them really well, some people want some topical anesthetic on it. I think, you know, there's not a right or wrong answer. It just depends upon uh, how you feel. And usually most of us would, would uh, take care of that. With regards to potential complications, you can get a bruise. I think that's probably the most common complication that we have when we give uh, injections is that you might get a little bruise there, especially if you're on blood thinners. Um, infections rare, pain from the injection, obviously you're gonna, you might have some of that. We could give you too much, might not give you enough, could give you a droopy lid, rarely double vision, uh, could give you so much that you don't close your eyes well and you might have to use some artificial tears afterwards if you're not already using them. And sometimes if the eye is a little bit irritated, as crazy as it sounds, a dry eye will often tear. And so sometimes you'll have some tearing after the injections. With regards to spread of the toxin, again, um, the toxin does diffuse from the sites, so that's how it affects these other muscles. Uh, hypersensitivity reactions, sort of allergies or tolerance to the, uh, to the toxin. What we do see in some patients is that with time, they might uh, develop a tolerance to the toxin, and some of this is just due to the fact that some of them will develop antibodies to the toxin. We're injecting a foreign substance into you, and your body's immune system's job is to, uh, you know, try to counteract this. So sometimes you'll get antibody formation to this, and that might result in you needing a bigger dose. Sometimes you just need to move to a different toxin. And I think that's one of the great things about having multiple toxins available, is that rather than the old days when we just had Botox, now we have multiple toxins available so that if, if one isn't working well for you or if you've developed the tolerance to it, you can move to a different toxin. So something that's, that's useful. So let's just talk quickly about what's new in the literature late, lately. Um, I'm just gonna go over some of the articles over the last two years. Uh, article uh, that showed that treatment of blepharospasm with botulinum toxin relieves anxiety and depression in, in patients with these problems. And so as, you, as many of you know, you know, this is something that can cause a little bit of depression as well as anxiety and treatment with botulinum toxin does actually improve these anxiety and depression scores. Um, also, it, in, it impacts the quality of life. So these are, even though these seems like things that are obvious to you, a lot of times we have to prove this. And some of this is proving it to the insurance company so that they actually uh, will pay for the injections because if we have evidence, let's say one day the insurance company says, we don't think that this is really helpful for these patients. We have evidence in the literature that, literature that says increases, you know, improves anxiety, improves depression, improves quality of life. So important things to have in the literature. Um, actually, in this paper, what it showed is that when you blink a lot, sometimes it can increase the pressure in the eye. And what they found is that treatment with uh, botulinum toxin uh, decreased that pressure. Um, long-term efficacy of, of the toxin in the treatment of blepharospasm. So basically what this shows is that this is not just uh, an acute or a short-term benefit. This is something that gives you a long-term benefit throughout your life. 
Um, and then another one here is, like we said earlier, is that sometimes you can get some bruising after in the injection. And the question of this study was whether it was safe in patients with oral anticoagulation. And it actually did show that it's safe. So, you know, you don't have to stop your Coumadin if you're on that in order to get injections. So it's a safe, you might bruise a little bit more, but it's safe overall. And then lastly, um, what this looked at was as we had, dis as we had, uh, uh, as I had said earlier, some, some physicians will use a preceptal or a pretarsal uh, site for the injections, and basically it shows that the pretarsal is a little better with regards to needing a lower dose, more efficacy, patient satisfaction, fewer complications. So again, everybody does their, their, their injections differently, um, but you know, pretarsal seems to give you a little better uh, result. And you know, other uses of the toxin other than blepharospasm, cervical dystonia, spasmodic dysphonia, hemifacial spasm, uh, spasticity, chronic migraine, you hear a lot about it with chronic migraine. Hyperhidrosis is uh, when you sweat a lot, you know, a lot of sweating, it turns off your sweating. Overactive bladder, urinary frequency, et cetera. Um, but you know, the thing that you hear most about are the cosmetic uses. And what are they used for? It's used for what we call dynamic lines, which means wrinkles that occur when your face moves. And so if you have wrinkles from your face moving, you know, basically the botulinum toxin is just used to paralyze the muscle that's causing that wrinkle, and that's how it's used. And so this is really what you hear about more than any, anything else in the, in the lay press with regards to the use of botulinum toxin. And um, you know, again, injection, interestingly, is very similar, dosing is very similar to what we see with blepharospasm, so very similar amounts that are used. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Happy to be here today, and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks.